Okay, so first, let me preface everything um, with the fact that A, I am not very creative, um, and B, I am not very tech savvy. Um, but with that being said, I have put together this um, video to try to help you access scene two, or act two, sorry, of the crucible. Um, because I'm sure that just reading Act 1 was not a ton of fun, and it was probably a little bit difficult to understand since we weren't in class and your classmates weren't reading parts, and I wasn't there um, to kind of break down everything that was going on. So, you know, this is um, something that I'm trying out to hopefully make it a little bit more interesting for you um, and to also make it a little more clear about what is going on. Um, so I have my crucible text right next to me. So I will be, you know, reading some things out of the text. I will be, uh, there will be things on the screen that I'll be reading to you. Um, I'll also kind of just be summarizing things that are going on. So it's kind of like we're in class and you're getting an act two crash course of the crucible. So there is going to be a lot of information, but hopefully um, the explanations that you will be getting will help to really um, facilitate your understanding as we move through Act 2. Okay, so with that being said, let's just recap Act 1 really quick. So we know that the girls were all dancing in the woods and Reverend Paris caught them. Um, Ruth and Tichiba were conjuring, uh, or at least trying to. Um, the Most of the girls were dancing. Mercy Lewis was running around naked. And we know that Abigail drank blood. Okay. After Reverend Paris catches them in the woods, Betty and Ruth, they're both very young. They're afraid that they're going to get in trouble. So they kind of, you know, they faint and then they fake this illness and people in the town start gossiping and things kind of snowball and get out of control and they think that they are, you know, under some sort of witch's spell. So Reverend Paris calls in Reverend Hale, who is the witchcraft expert. Okay, we find out that Abigail and John Proctor had an affair before everything started um, Abby wants to continue the affair, which is why she drinks blood because she wants to kill Elizabeth Proctor and get her out of the way so she can be with John Proctor. But we also see that John Proctor is not interested in continuing the affair. Okay, so he doesn't want to be with Abigail, even though she wants to be with him. Um, when Reverend Hale arrives, he is questioning Abigail about what they were doing in the woods, and she feels a great deal of pressure, and she doesn't want to get in trouble, you know, so she kind of flips the script and blames Tichuba. So Tichuba becomes the scapegoat for everybody's bad behavior in the woods because she has a very low status in town because she is a slave, and two, she doesn't really have anybody who's going to stick up for her or help her. Okay, so Tichuba then is being questioned and she's being pressured and, um, you know, they're being kind of mean to Tichuba and they're telling her basically, if you don't confess to being a witch, which we know you are, we're going to take you out back and we're going to kill you. Okay, so Tichuba's options are, oh, let me think, I can confess to witchcraft and, you know, live or I can keep denying it even though it's the truth and be taken out back and killed. Okay. So Tichuba's like, oh, I'm going to save myself. So she confesses to witchcraft and she confesses to being aligned with the devil, even though she is not. Okay. She is not a witch, but she says that she is. And she says that she made a mistake and that she's so sorry and she wants to come back to the side of God. And Reverend Hale, once she says this, Reverend Hale is like, oh my gosh, Tichuba, come on back. Come be saved by God. You know, we're so happy that we got you out of the grips of the devil um, and now you're saved and we're so happy um, that you're no longer with the devil and you can live. So that's really great. Um, but also, you need to tell us other witches. Otherwise, we're not really going to be satisfied. So with some more pressure, 
from Reverend Hale and others, Tichuba starts naming other members of the community, you know, who are of low status like herself. And she says that they are witches. And everybody is so happy that she, um, that she names other people for them to go out and get, right? They need a reason for why these bad things are happening in town. And now this is a great way to place blame. Abigail and Betty are also in the room when all of this is happening. And Abigail sees that, oh my gosh, Tichuba is no longer in trouble. In fact, they are praising Tichuba and telling her how great she is just because she confessed. So then Abigail, to kind of get out of trouble, does the same thing, okay? And she starts blaming the same people that Tichuba blamed and then even more people. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is so great. You were in the grips of the devil and now you're back with God. You're on God's side and you're going to help us rid the town of Salem of any witches, okay? So Tichuba... Abigail and Betty are the first three people that start accusing other people of the community of witchcraft. Okay, so that's kind of where Act One um, finishes up. Okay, so now let's just move into some characters that we're going to be introduced to or see more of in act two. So if you look on the screen over on the left-hand side at the top, we have John and Elizabeth Proctor. Um, John's got the hat on with the brown shirt and boots. And Elizabeth kind of looks like a teacher. Sorry, you know, <laughs> I, I did the best that I had uh, to work with. Then um, if you go down on the left side, we see Giles Corey and his wife, Martha Corey. So they're both elderly. We met Giles in act one. You know, he was, he's kind of old. He's a little bit weird. He's kind of kooky. He provides some comic relief. Um, he's in court a lot um, and gets caught up in legal battles. Um, and he also, even though we didn't meet his wife, Martha, we find out that, you know, she has been reading some books and maybe that caused the stoppage of his prayer. And he mentions that to Reverend Hale, not intentionally to get his wife in trouble, um, just out of curiosity. And, you know, he kind of puts his foot in his mouth there. Then if we look to the right side of the page at the top, we have Mary Warren. We met Mary Warren in act one. She is one of the girls that was dancing in the woods. Uh, she works for John and Elizabeth Proctor now since Abigail was fired. Um, and, you know, Mary Warren is really upset about the things that are going on, about the fact that people are talking about witchcraft. She's really afraid. She doesn't want to get in trouble. She wants to tell the truth, okay, even though Abigail does not, and Abigail has threatened her and the other girls um, that you can't tell anybody what they really did in the woods. Otherwise, Abby will come after them. Um, in the middle of the top row, all in black, we have Reverend Hale. Um, and then if you look towards the bottom, we have Ezekiel Cheever. He's a new character. He's sort of like an acting cop. Okay, so they didn't really have a lot of police officers back then. Um, but now as things start to unravel and get out of control, we see that there are more people that are aligned with the court. Um, and then in the bottom of the middle row, nope, in the middle of the bottom row, there we go, um, we have Francis and Rebecca Nurse. Now, we met Rebecca in Act One. You know, she, they are both elderly. They're very highly respected members of the community. They're very um, pious and religious, and they do the right things. A lot of people look up to them. They have a lot of children. The Putnams really don't like the nurses. The nurses were a part of the faction or the group of people that kept Thomas Putnam's brother-in-law from being the minister in Salem. Okay. So, um, you know, even though they are very powerful, they do have some enemies. 
Okay, but they are very good people. So these, this is the group of characters that um, we will be seeing in Act Two. All right, so Act Two takes place eight days later at the Proctor House. So after all of the girls go off and start accusing all of these members of the community, when we when we leave scene or sorry Act One, we see that eleven people have been accused by the girls, okay? 11 people. So even though the Proctors do live in the town of Salem, they are five miles away from where everything took place during Act 1, okay? So we're going to be meeting the Proctors in just a minute. Okay, so this is right out of the text. Um, or maybe it's... Nope. So this is just bits and pieces from the text. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we see in this picture that there's John Proctor. We see a pot of stew or something over a fire. You might recognize the meme. We have some salt bay. You'll find out why he's in the picture or on the slide in just a minute. So um, the scene opens up in the common room of the Proctor house. For this time period, they have a pretty nice house. Uh, when the curtain rises, Elizabeth can be heard singing to the children. So yes, the Proctors have children. They have three young boys. Okay, so John Proctor comes home from working outside or out in the field. Um, he enters the house and there's a pot like I just mentioned. And he tastes the stew and he doesn't really, you know, he's not satisfied with how he tastes, you know, it's okay. So he adds some salt to it. I know it sounds silly, like what, adding salt to a stew. Why is that something that we need to mention? But it's important. So we'll see that a little bit later. So after he adds the salt, then Elizabeth enters the room. Okay. So, so. They're talking back and forth. It's a little bit awkward. Elizabeth wants to know, you know, why John is coming home so late. And, you know, he says he's working. He's all the way out to the edge of the forest. Okay. So, you know, it, it's the conversation between them is just very, very awkward. It's not that of a loving couple that you might see. Um you know, so they talk about a little bit about the weather. John asks Elizabeth how she's feeling. Okay. And then they kind of go and sit down to dinner and John tells her that he really likes the stew and he says that it's well seasoned. Okay. Well, what did we just mention in the last slide? Does he actually think that the stew tastes good and that it's well seasoned? Well, not according to his actions if he just added salt. So, you know, he's saying these things that he knows is going to make Elizabeth happy, even though they're not actually true. So, he, you know, a little white lie to try to make his wife happy. And then he goes on to say that, you know, I'm trying to do things to make you happy, Elizabeth. I mean to please you. Um, so he's trying, right? We see a concerted effort from John Proctor trying to make Elizabeth happy, okay? And, you know, she's not totally having it. You know, at one point he gets up to go and kiss her, to kiss her, and she kind of gives him the cheek, you know? So she's not really interested in giving him a kiss or being affectionate, you know? And then John makes a comment and he says, it is winter in here yet. Now, does he actually mean it's the season winter? Well, no, he's talking about, you know, her icy demeanor and the fact that she's not overly friendly with him and she's not overly affectionate with him. But what do we know that Elizabeth knows? What happened between John and Abigail, right? John had an affair. Elizabeth 100% knows about the affair. So, you know, can we really blame her for not being, you know, lovey-dovey towards John Proctor? I don't know. That's up for you to decide. Um, but that's where they are at so far. All right. So then we move on. Um, they continue talking and Elizabeth mentions, you know, like, I thought that you were coming home late because you were in Salem. And John's like, 
Salem. Well, I don't have any business in Salem. Why would you think that I was there? Uh, and Elizabeth, you know, you just mentioned it earlier in the week, so I wasn't sure. And then Elizabeth says that Mary Warren is in Salem. And John Proctor gets a little bit upset because, you know, Mary Warren shouldn't be in Salem. Where should Mary Warren be? Oh, at the Proctor house doing her job, right? Because she works for the Proctors. Okay, so she shouldn't be in Salem. Um, so John Proctor gets a little bit angry and he asks Elizabeth, like, why would you allow her to go to Salem when I forbid her to go to Salem? And Elizabeth's like, well, listen, I, I could only do so much. I couldn't stop her. Okay. And then we see at the top of this page, um, where it says important quotes, John Proctor says, how do you let that mouse frighten you, Elizabeth? And she says, it is a mouse no more. I forbid her to go. And she raises up her chin like a daughter of a prince and says to me, I must go to Salem, Goody Proctor. I am an official of the court. Okay. So we see that you know, kind of Mary Warren's characters changing a little bit. So John Proctor calls her a mouse. How would you describe a mouse? You know, a mouse is something that is skittish and timid and scared of things. So he's using a mouse to compare and comparing it to Mary Warren, saying that she is very much like a mouse, um, scared and skittish. And then Elizabeth tells him that, no, she is no longer that skittish little girl, okay? She asserts her authority to Elizabeth because she thinks that she is important now. She thinks, or she is an official of the court. So she's sort of, you know, um, coming or trying to come into her own and assert some authority because she is part of the court in this ongoing witchcraft investigation. Okay, so they continue talking. Um, we find out that, let's see. Sorry, I'm taking a look at the text right now. Um, Elizabeth lets John know. So this is information that Elizabeth gets from Mary Warren. So she lets John know that they have like a, an actual court going right now. Um, and that there are 14 people that are going to be in jail now. Uh, and the court has the power to hang people. Okay. So this is news to John. He didn't know any of this. Elizabeth is just telling him this, um, on their own. And then uh, Proctor, Proctor can't believe it. He goes, he doesn't think that they would ever hang anybody. And Elizabeth tells them that the deputy governor promised hanging if they not confess, John. Okay. So if people are accused and they are brought to the court and they don't confess, they'll die. They will hang them. But if they do confess, then they'll get to live. So we saw that earlier in Act 1 with Tituba. Okay. So then, let's see. Um, you know, Proctor, he is in disbelief. Um, and Elizabeth says to John, I think you must go to Salem, John. I think so. You must tell them this is fraud. John replies to her and he says, I, it is, it is surely. So Elizabeth says, go to Ezekiel Cheever, right? He's like the cop, but you know, John Proctor, he knows them, they're friends. Um, Elizabeth says, why don't you go to Ezekiel Cheever and say that you know that it has nothing to do with witchcraft? Because that's what Abigail told you, right? Abigail said that it had nothing to do with with witchcraft. And John agrees. He says, yeah, she did. And Elizabeth's like, okay, so you agreed with me that she said it had nothing to do with witchcraft. So go ahead and go tell, you know, some sort of authority figure that you know that this information is false and the girls are lying. Okay. Um, so Elizabeth kind of keeps pushing the issue. Like, John, you should go to Salem. John, you should tell um, some sort of authority that the girls are lying. And John's kind of like, yeah, I'll think about it. Maybe I will a little bit later. And Elizabeth finally says, like, you should go tonight. And Proctor's like, 
Yeah, no, I'll think about it. So Elizabeth keeps getting frustrated. Um, and Proctor is like, well, you know, I, I just, I can't do it because if I go, then it's going to be my word against hers. And, you know, she told me this information when we were alone and he kind of just go like, uh, skirts past that information. And Elizabeth's like, well, wait a second. You were alone with Abigail? And he's like, oh, well, what, um, yeah, but just for a minute, though. And Elizabeth's like, well, then it's not like you told me. So Elizabeth kind of catches him in a lie. So if you see um, on the left-hand side, right, Elizabeth asks, you were alone with her? For a moment, alone, I. Why then? It is not as you told me. Okay, so Elizabeth is kind of upset. Like, okay, so you had an affair. Now you went to Salem and you were alone with Abigail and then you come home and you tell me that she told you this information, but you were in a group of people and now you slip up and you're telling me that you were alone with her. Um, so Elizabeth is definitely, um, you know, kind of disappointed um, with the fact that, you know, John has lied to her about Abigail, but you know, you also have to think in John's defense, you know, how would it sound if he was alone with Abigail? So, you know, he's lying maybe more so to protect his wife than he is to protect himself because he knew that she would be upset. So it's a very, very difficult um, dynamic that we're seeing um, with their marriage right now. Okay. So they continue to kind of uh, go back and forth with like some biting comments, right? So after Elizabeth says that, you know, then it's not as you told me, um, we see in uh, the, the text, it tells us, you know, Elizabeth quietly, she suddenly has lost all faith in him. And she says, do as you wish then. And she tarts, starts to go and, and, and walk away from John because she's clearly fed up with him. And John says, woman, I will not have your suspicion anymore. And she starts to speak again and he interrupts and he says, I'll not have it. And she turns to him and says, then let you not earn it. Okay. So he's saying like, you can't be suspicious of me. I'm tired of that. And she's like, well, if you don't want me to be suspicious, then stop being suspicious and stop acting shady and stop letting me catch you in lies. Okay. And then John says, um, sorry, he says, you doubt me. And her response is, if you look up at the top uh, right hand side of the page. She says, John, if it were not Abigail that you must go to hurt, would you falter now? I think not. And basically Elizabeth is saying like, if it were anybody else, you would go to town in an instant and you would tell people that the girls are lying. But because it's Abigail and because you still maybe have feelings for her or you have some sort of soft spot in your heart for her, you're hesitant to go and you don't want to go. And, you know, so John Proctor, he definitely gets angry. Um, and he says to her, let you look at your own improvement before you judge your husband anymore. I have forgot Abigail. And, and as he's saying, and Elizabeth cuts him off and she says, and I. So as he's saying, like, I forgot all about Abigail. I don't want anything to do with her. Elizabeth interrupts him and says, well, yeah, you forgot about me too, right? Like I'm supposed to be your wife here and you haven't done anything maybe that a husband should be doing for a wife. Um, and then we see John Proctor, his response, um, on the right hand side of the page and he says I come into a court when I come into this house uh so he's basically telling his wife you know like I feel so judged all you do is judge me and I feel guilty about everything that I've done and now should he feel guilty probably I mean he did have an affair but you know uh, are they trying to work through it? What exactly is going on in the marriage? So he is constantly feeling judged by his wife. Um, and we find out um, with for the affair that, um, you know, Elizabeth was suspicious about what was going on between John and Abigail. And she confronted John Proctor and he 
confessed to everything. So at, Elizabeth didn't catch them. John Proctor confessed, you know, so he, he kind of goes into this thing about saying, you know, I confessed to you. I didn't have to do that. I didn't have to tell you the truth, but I did because, you know, like, even though I did this terrible thing, I'm still a good person. Um, and Elizabeth kind of, you know, tells him that she, you know, John, I don't judge you. The magistrate sits in your heart that judges you. So she's just saying, you know, it's your own guilt that's making you feel so judged by me. And then John Proctor says, oh, Elizabeth, your justice would freeze beer. Now, what do we know about alcohol and really cold temperatures? Does it freeze? No, it doesn't. So he's just saying that, you know, Elizabeth's personality and just Elizabeth in general as she is just or she has been or maybe she has always been so cold and icy um, that even, you know, the way she acts, that could even freeze beer. Okay, so like I said, they're going back and forth with um, some not so nice things that to each other because of everything that is going on now in the town of Salem. And then uh, they're kind of interrupted, right? Mary Warren um, arrives home and she's acting a little bit strange. And this sort of interrupts the disagreement that has been going on all day. And the proctors are a little bit confused because um, her behavior is very, very strange. And Mary Warren says, I am sick. I am sick, Mr. Proctor. Pray, pray, hurt me not. Her strangeness throws him off and her evident pallor and weakness. He frees her. My insides are all shuddery. I am in the proceedings all day, sir. So like I said, John Proctor, he's not happy that she went to Salem and he is um, definitely showing his displeasure in that. And then Mary Warren's strange behavior, you know, the fact that she... Um, you know, just that she is being very different than she normally is kind of throws him off. Okay. So he kind of, at first he, he is aggressive towards her and he kind of backs off. Right. And he's like, well, what of these proceedings, you know, tell me about what's going on. Um, and you know, like, why do I even keep you employed here if you're not going to be here and you're going to be in Salem all day? Um, and you know, like Mary Warren, it seems like she's trying to compensate. Uh, so she, uh, holds out her hand and she's carrying this weird little doll. Um, it's a poppet and, um, she gives it to Elizabeth. She says, I made a gift for you today, Goody Proctor. I had to sit long hours in a chair and pass the time with sewing. And Elizabeth responds and she says, why, thank you. It is a fair poppet. And Mary Warren says, we must all love each other now, Goody Proctor. And they're still <laughs> very thrown off by Mary Warren's strange behavior. And Elizabeth replies and she says, I, indeed we must. And Mary Warren then says, I'll get up early in the morning and clean the house. I must sleep now. And Proctor, before Mary Warren walks out, says, Mary, is it true there be 14 women arrested? And then Mary responds and says, no, sir, there be 39 now. She suddenly breaks off and sobs and sits down exhausted. Okay, so we find out, right, the original number when we're in Act 1 and we're in the Paris household, the girls identify 11 people. They accuse 11 people. Then just a little bit earlier in the scene, Elizabeth tells John that there are 14 people that are now in jail. And now Mary arrives home and we find out that there are 39 people that are in jail. Okay, so then... We find out, you know, some Mary Warren gives us some more information. So she says, Goody Osborne will hang. Hang? He calls into her face. Hang, you say? So Proctor, he can't believe it that somebody's going to hang. And Mary Warren confirms, yeah, she's going to hang. Um, and John Proctor, once again, shocked, says the deputy governor will allow it. And Mary Warren tells him that the deputy governor is the one that sentenced her to hang. Okay, so Goody Osborne will hang, 
but not Sarah Good. So I hope we remember those two names from Act One. So Goody, Sarah Osborne will hang, Goody Good, she will live because Sarah Good or Goody Good, she confessed. And Proctor wants to know, confess to what? Um, and then Mary Warren's response is that she, she sometimes made a compact with Lucifer and wrote her name in his black book with her blood and bound herself to torment Christian t Christians till God's throw down. We must all worship and we must all worship hell forever more. And Proctor can't believe it. He says, but surely you know what a jabberer she is. Did you tell them that? And Mary Warren says, Mr. Proctor, in open court, she near to choke us to death. So Mary Warren's saying, well, yeah, I do know that information, but you don't understand because when we were in court, Sarah Osborne almost choked us all to death. And Proctor asks, how? Choked you? And Mary Warren says she sent her spirit out. And Elizabeth tries to kind of talk some sense into her. And she says, oh, Mary, Mary, surely you... She tried to kill me many times, Goody Proctor. Okay, so now we're going to hear some information um, from Mary Warren about Goody Osborne and how she has, you know, at some point tried to kill Mary Warren. Okay, so this is basically Mary Warren's testimony while she was in court. So she's telling the Proctors what she said in court. So she says, I never knew it before. I never knew anything before. When she come into the court, I say to myself, I must not accuse this woman for she sleeps in ditches and so very old and poor. But then, then she sit there denying and denying and I feel a misty coldness climbing up my back and the skin on my skull begin to creep and I feel a clamp around my neck and I cannot breathe air and then... I hear a voice, a screaming voice, and it were my voice. And all at once, I remember everything she'd done to me. And Proctor's like, what? What are you, like, what are you talking about? What did she do to you? And Mary Warren says, so many times, Mr. Proctor, she come to this very door begging bread and a cup of cider. And mark this, whenever I turned her away, empty, she mumbled. Mumbled? She may mumble if she's hungry. That's what Elizabeth says. And then Mary Warren comes back and says, but what does she mumble? You must remember, Goody Proctor. Last month, a Monday, I think she walked away. And, and I thought my guts would burst for two days after. Do you remember? <laughs> so Mary Warren is basically saying it's so obvious that Goody Osborne is a witch because since she's poor and old and homeless and she comes around to the houses and she knocks on people's door and she begs for cider and she begs for bread and food or anything that she can get her hands on. And when Mary Warren tells her, nope, sorry, you can't have any. When Goody Osborne leaves, she mumbles things under her breath. Okay. So Mary Warren is saying that when she was mumbling, She's trying to put a spell on Mary Warren. Now, if you're homeless and you're starving and you ask somebody, um, you know, to kind of be kind to you and give you something to eat and they say no and slam a door in your face, I mean, what sorts of things do you think Goody Osborne was mumbling about Mary Warren? But Mary Warren says that it must have been a spell because two days after she told Goody Osborne that she wasn't going to give her anything, she got really, really sick. Okay. And she said, so there it is. That's the proof that she's a witch and she put a spell on me. So John Proctor and Elizabeth Proctor are like, are you being serious? Like, that's what you said in court and they believed you? And she says, yes. And then... You know, um, the judge asks uh, Goody Osborne what sort of curses that she put on me. And she said that she was just saying her commandments. So Judge Hathorn, that's the judge um, uh, that's presiding over the courts right now. The judge asks Goody Osborne to say her commandments. And she said that she was mumbling her commandments. And when she was on the stand, she wasn't able to recite any of the Ten Commandments. So that is just more proof 
that, um, you know, she's a witch <laughs> and she should die, basically. Um, so let's see. Moving along. Um, John, let me see. Whoops. <laughs> so John Proctor you know, thinks that this is all nonsense because, you know, it is and tells Mary Warren basically that Mary Warren, you're not going to court. I forbid you to go to court. Um, and you basically you're going to stay here. And Mary Warren's like, oh, I have to go. I'm an official of the court. I can't believe that you don't see how important the work is that will, that we're doing here. And John Proctor's like, important work. I didn't realize that, you know, basically sending old women to hang was important work. And Mary Warren says, but Mr. Proctor, they will not hang if they confess. Sarah Good will only sit in jail sometime. And here's a wonder for you. Think on this. Goody Good is pregnant. Okay, so we find out that one of the women that was accused, Sarah Good, is pregnant. Now, John and Elizabeth can't believe it, but one of the reasons why she won't hang, so first she confessed, and then the second reason is um, they won't hang her because they will not hurt the innocent child, okay? So um, Christians view that, you know, unborn children are innocent, right? So if they hang Sarah Good, then they'll be killing an innocent child. So they're not going to do that. So if you're pregnant, you know, you won't die, basically, or you at least have um, the rest of your pregnancy to live uh, before you are hanged. So that is some interesting information that we find out as well. All right. So um, basically, Mary after Mary Warren tells this story, um, she tells John Proctor once again, like, I'm going to do what I want, which is going to Salem and testifying against these people and being an official of the court. She says, the devil's loose in Salem, Mr. Proctor. We must discover where he's hiding. And John Proctor is so fed up with Mary at this point. He tells her that I'll whip the devil out of you, right? And he goes over to the mantle and he grabs his whip and he is about to whip Mary Warren. Um, and she yells and runs and then reveals this big shocker. And she points over to Elizabeth Proctor and yells, I saved her life today. Okay. So hopefully we know what that means. If, if she saved her life today, what do we think happened in court? So Elizabeth asks, I am accused. And Mary responds, somewhat mentioned, but I said, I never see no sign you ever sent your spirit out to hurt no one. And seeing I do live so closely with you, they dismissed it. Okay. So Mary tells the proctors that Elizabeth has been accused, which is a huge shock because up to this point, what types of people were we seeing being accused? People like Tituba, people like Sarah Good, people like Sarah Osborne, people who are beggars, who are homeless, who don't have high standing in the village, who um, don't have anybody to stick up for them. And now we hear that Elizabeth is accused. So this is a big time change because, you know, Elizabeth is a very well respected member of the community. Okay. So this is, you know, a big revelation here. Okay, so Elizabeth asks, who accused me? And Mary Warren basically says, well, I can't tell you. I'm bound by the court. I'm not allowed to give out that sorts of information. Um, you know, and John Proctor is so disgusted at this point and, you know, so upset now that Elizabeth has been accused. He's dismissive of Mary Warren and he tells Mary Warren, he's like, Mary Warren, just go to bed, get out of here, leave. And Mary Warren tries to kind of stick up for herself again, right? Cause she's no longer, you know, a, a mouse. Um, and she says, I'll not be ordered to bed no more, Mr. Proctor. I'm 18 and a woman, however single. 
And then Proctor responds, do you wish to sit up? Then sit up. And Mary Warren responds with, I wish to go to bed. And Proctor says, good night then. <laughs> so Mary Warren, although she is trying to stick up for herself and no longer be that timid mouse, um, we still see that she is very timid and she's not really able to stick up to John Proctor. Um, and she's still, you know, fairly <laughs> unsure of this newfound uh, power that she has that's working in court where people believe her versus when she's outside of court and, you know, people like John Proctor who, you know, are thinking logically and actually know that the girls are lying. Okay, so then we go back to John Proctor and Elizabeth Proctor and, you know, they're talking about the fact that like, oh my gosh, uh, Abigail wants me dead, right? So Elizabeth says, oh, the noose, the noose is up. And she means for herself, right? What's a noose? Does anybody know? The noose is the rope um, that they use when they hang people. So Elizabeth basically is saying that like the noose is about to be around her neck. And John tells her there'll be no noose. And Elizabeth responds with, she wants me dead. I knew it all week. It would come to this. John says, they dismissed it. You heard her say, and what of tomorrow? She will cry me out again until they take me. So Elizabeth, you know, she's at a loss for words. And now John, he doesn't know what to do because uh, Elizabeth has, has been accused. Um, and so, you know, after hearing this information, John Proctor's like, well, don't be afraid because I'm going to go to Ezekiel Cheever and I'm going to tell him that the girls were lying. So now that Elizabeth is accused, John Proctor is no longer hesitant about going to tell some sort of authority figure about Abigail and the other girls. Um, so this kind of tells us, you know, that even though John did have an affair and even though in this scene he hasn't been so loving and really nice to Elizabeth, but we can tell that he does care about her right now that she is actually in danger. He is willing, you know, to go and involve himself and insert himself in this, uh, investigation that he really wants nothing to do with. Um, and then, you know, they're still going back and forth. And Elizabeth tells John, she thinks to take my place, right? Abigail clearly wants Elizabeth out of the picture, which is why she accused her. So if she accuses Elizabeth, then they'll take her off to jail. She'll die. And then Abby thinks that she'll be able to be John Proctor's wife. Okay. Um, so, you know, they're, they continue going back and forth. They're arguing. They're frustrated with each other. They're frustrated with the situation that is going on. We see that there is, you know, definitely some broken trust and trust issues. Elizabeth is frustrated with John. John is frustrated with the situation. So, you know, lots of tension going on here. And then uh, Reverend Hale knocks on their door. So Reverend Hale shows up at the Proctor household. Um, and he just kind of, he's there on his own. He wasn't sent by the courts, even though he is working for the courts and he is trying to help the courts decide, are these people witches? Are these people not witches? Are they innocent? Are they guilty? What's going on, right? He is the witchcraft expert. But he does want the truth, okay? So he, he is a little bit different than what we see from Reverend Paris or maybe the Putnams who have ulterior motives to why they might be accusing people. So Reverend Hale has been going around Salem and he's trying to um, get to know people. So he arrives at the proctor's house um, and he tells them that he's not here on official court business. He's come on his own. He just wants to get to know the proctors and understand them as people. Um, because, you know, Elizabeth name, Elizabeth's name has been mentioned. Okay. Um, but also he tells the proctors that Rebecca Nurse, 
her name has been mentioned and John and Elizabeth, they can't believe it. Oh my gosh. I can't believe, you know, Elizabeth nurse it would be, you know, accused of witchcraft. You know, it's almost laughable. And, and Hale kind of agrees with them. He doesn't think that, you know, that she is actually a witch, but he basically says anything is possible. Anybody could be aligned with evil forces because, you know, that's basically how the devil works. Okay, so then they go on and, and Reverend Hale says, if you see in the thought bubble, I thought, sir, to put some question as to the Christian character of this house, if you'll permit me. So Reverend Hale kind of wants to ask the proctors questions about the fact, you know, some things that may have been said about them in town. So his first question um, that he poses, he says to John Proctor uh, that it shows in the attendance book at church that you don't really come every Sunday and actually uh, you rarely come on Sunday. And John Proctor's like, you know, I go to church. Like, what are you talking about? Uh, and Hale says, 26 time in 17 months, sir. I must call that rare. Will you tell me why you are so absent? And Proctor tells Hale, um, you know, like, Elizabeth has been sick, so he's there to take care of her, or he stays home to take care of her. Um, and Reverend Hale responds, like, well, you can attend church without your wife. And then, so Proctor's like, all right, you know what? Forget with all the trying to be nice. So then he goes on and says that, he doesn't like to go to church um, because uh, Reverend Paris, and he says, a minister may pray to God without he have golden candlesticks upon the altar. And Hale asks, like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Golden candlesticks. And Proctor says that since we built the church, we've had, you know, pewter candlesticks, which is just another type of metal. And when there were pewter candlesticks on the altar, every single day, Reverend Paris would preach about having candlesticks and, you know, the fact that the pewter candlesticks just weren't good enough. And he didn't think, John Proctor doesn't think, that it's appropriate for a preacher to be preaching about golden candlesticks. And he says, when I look to heaven and see my money glaring at his hell elbows, it hurts my prayer. Okay, um, so Hale, Reverend Hale's like, okay, well, I, I guess that makes sense, but nonetheless, you should still attend church. Um, and then Reverend Hale moves his questioning on and he says, so you have three children, isn't that right? And Proctor says, yeah, I have three sons. And Reverend Hale asks him, um, well, you only have two of your sons baptized. Why is that? <laughs> and Proctor says, I like it not that Mr. Parrish should lay his hand upon my baby. I see no light of God in that man. I'll not conceal it. So John Proctor straight up tells Reverend Hale, I don't like Reverend Paris. I don't like him, uh, you know, so far as to not let my son be baptized by him. Um... And, you know, Reverend Hale is like, oh, geez, um, you know, he's a minister. He's a good person. So you should definitely have your son baptized. And John Proctor's like, what is the problem here? What are you suspecting? I nailed the roof upon the church. I hung the door. I, you know, I have a lot of things uh, that count for me and not just against me. And Reverend Hale's like, oh, well, that is a good sign. I'm so happy to hear that. Um and then it kind of seems like Reverend Hale is ready to leave. And then he asks one more question and he says, do you know your commandments? And they're like, well, of course we know our, our commandments. We're good church going people. We love God. You know, we follow the Bible. We're definitely not witches. Um, and Reverend Hale's like, great. Can you go ahead and, uh, you know, recite your commandments for me? So here is John Proctor, and he starts going through um, his commandments. 
Okay, so we have, oh, I missed one on here, but the first one is thou shalt not kill. And then he says, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's good, nor make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. Thou shalt not have, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Thou shalt honor thy father and mother. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And then he stops and he's thinking and he's counting on his fingers the commandments that he's already recited. And then he says, thou shalt not make unto thee any grieving image. And you see that I can, uh, that I wrote there that no, that's not a typo. Hopefully that sounds familiar to you because John Proctor already said that. So he says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. He says that twice. Okay. So that means he's only recited nine of the commandments. Okay. So he's sitting there and he's lost and he, you know, Reverend Hale can kind of see that he's stuck and uh, Elizabeth can see that he's stuck. And since he can't come up with the last commandment, Elizabeth chimes in and says, adultery, John. Okay. So, um, it, do we know what adultery is? So adultery is the act of cheating. So the last commandment, the single commandment that John Proctor couldn't remember, adultery, that you should not commit adultery, that is the commandment that John Proctor broke. Okay. So uh, as he's reciting his commandments, you know, his wife is like, are you serious? Uh, like adultery, the one that you committed, you that's the one that you forget, uh, you know, so that, that's why I have the nice little uh, thought bubble of the uh, irony of the situation. Okay. So, you know, John is obviously super embarrassed. Um, Reverend Hale has no idea about the affair. Okay. So after Elizabeth is like, irony, John, John tells him, you know, oh, see, between the both of us, we know our commandments. So, you know, we're real, real good Christians here. And, you know, Hale's a little bit like, eh, okay, well, um, you know, you should still know your Ten Commandments. So he's not like wholly satisfied uh, with the fact that John struggled to name all of his commandments. Um, but, you know, Reverend Hale is like, all right, well, I, I'm going to get ready to go. And Elizabeth says to John in front of Reverend Hale, I think you must tell him, John. You know, so of course, Reverend Hale's like, tell me what? And John Proctor is now obviously going to be annoyed um, with Elizabeth because she kind of, you know, put him in a situation where he doesn't want to say anything. And now he kind of has to. He's obligated because Reverend Hale is there and asking. Um, so Proctor kind of says hesitantly, he says, I, I have no witness and cannot prove it except my word be taken. But I know the children's sickness had not to do with witchcraft. And Hale can't believe it. And, you know, he kind of like stops in, in his tracks and not to do with witchcraft. And Proctor says, Mr. Paris discovered them sporting in the woods. They were startled and took sick. And Reverend Hale, at who told you this? And Proctor tells him that Abigail Williams... And once again, Hale is in disbelief and he, he can't understand why Abigail would tell him that it had nothing to do with witchcraft. And, you know, Hale says, when did you, when did she tell you about this? And Proctor says, you know, the day that we were all at Reverend Paris's house and Hale, you know, can't understand like, why John would keep this information for so long, you know, but once again, John had no idea that these things had gone and out of control, right? And then Reverend Hale says, it's nonsense. Mister, I have examined Tituba, Sarah Good, and numerous others that have confessed to dealing with the devil. They have confessed it. So that's what Reverend Hale says, okay? So obviously he, his train of thought is, you know, they must be witches because they confessed to it. 
Now, Proctor, on the other hand, comes back with, if you see over on the left-hand side of the page, he says, and why not if they must hang for denying it? There are them that will swear to anything before they'll hang. Have you never thought of that? Okay. And then Hale's like, well, well, yeah, I, I sort of have thought about it, but you know, I, I still think that they're witches. Okay. So John Proctor, you know, plants this seed that you know, obviously people are going to say that they're witches. They're going to confess that they're witches if the alternative is you're going to die, you know. So Reverend Hale, um, he's not wholly satisfied now with his visit to the Proctors. And then Hale brings up something that was said about the Proctors. And he says, Proctor, let you open with me now, for I have a rumor that troubles me. It's said you hold no belief that there may even be witches in the world. Is that true, sir? And Proctor hesitates for a minute because he wants to think this through. He knows this is a very weighted question um, and his answer is going to have, you know, repercussions one way or another. And John Proctor says, I know not what I have said. I may have said it. I have wondered if there be witches in the world, although I cannot believe they come among us now. And Hale responds with, then you do not believe and Par Proctor says, I have no knowledge of it. The Bible speaks of witches, and I will not deny them. And you, woman? So Hale asking Elizabeth, and she says, I I cannot believe it. And he can't believe it. And, and you know, Proctor is like, Elizabeth, why are you saying that? And she says, I cannot think the devil may own a woman's soul, Mr. Hale, when she keeps an upright way as I have. I am a good woman. I know it. And if you believe I may do only good work in the world and yet be secretly bound to Satan, then I must tell you, sir, I do not believe it. So this is like big, a big, big no-no for Elizabeth to be saying because, you know, how do these people live, right? They live by the Bible. So anything that's in the Bible, it must be true. And the Bible says that there are witches. And now Elizabeth is saying, well, even if the Bible says there are witches, if you think I'm a witch, you know, then I just can't believe it because that is bananas to me. So she basically says, she doesn't believe in witches. And then if you look over another quote, she says, if you think that I am one, I say there are none. Okay. So, you know, this is, this is a big deal. She's being a little bit rebellious now. She, she is not going to say that there are witches because she knows that she's a good person and, and that all of this is 100% nonsense. And Hale is, you know, now starting to get a little bit worried about the Proctor household and the fact that they are kind of being uh, rebellious to the fact of um, the fact that the Bible mentions witches and they're denying it. During this conversation, then we hear a knock at the door. So uh, Giles Corey and Francis Nurse come knocking at the door of the Proctor household. Um, and they are talking to John and, and they come rushing in because they are very close friends with the Proctors. And they say that Rebecca and Martha have been arrested. So there have been people that have been at their house and they arrested the two women and they have taken them away. Okay, so Elizabeth, they can't, she can't believe it. Um, you know, Proctor can't believe it. Everybody is so surprised about how, you know, about the fact that these two women um, are being accused of witchcraft. Um, so then, of course, uh, they're asked what they are accused of. Okay, so Martha Corey, her accusation has to do with Walcott's pigs. All right, so when they ask Giles Corey, or Reverend Hale asks Giles Corey um, what Martha has been accused of, his response is that bloody mongrel Walcott charged her. You see, he buy a pig of my wife four or five years ago, and the pig died soon after. 
So he come dancing for his money back. So my Martha, she says to him, Walcott, if you haven't the wit to feed a pig properly, you'll not live to own many, she says. Now he goes to court and claims that from that day to this, he cannot keep a pig alive for more than four weeks because my Martha bewitched them with her books. Okay, so now here are the books that Giles Corey mentioned earlier in Act One, and they're kind of coming back to bite him. And this character, Walcott, basically says in court that at one point he bought pigs from Martha Corey and the pigs died soon after. We find out based off of what Martha says to Walcott that the pigs died because Walcott's not taking proper care of them, right? He doesn't feed them enough. And of course, if you don't feed something, it's going to die. But now he's blaming any of the, all the deaths of his livestock on Martha Corey. So that's why she has been accused, and that is why she has been arrested. Okay, so we find out this information, um, and then we find out about Rebecca Nurse, okay? And so we add, um, Reverend Hale asks, uh, how is Rebecca accused of witchcraft? What is she being accused of? And Francis says, for the murder, she's charged for the marvelous and supernatural murder of Goody Putnam's babies. Okay, so we know that Rebecca Nurse was a midwife for Mrs. Putnam while she was giving birth. And now Mrs. Putnam and Putnam, she is accusing Rebecca Nurse of killing her babies when they were just born, okay? Um, and we know that the Putnams have this big grudge against the nurses for many reasons. So we talked about the fact that one, the nurses, um, were a part of the group that kept Thomas Putnam's family member from being the minister in Salem. Um, there have been lots of land disputes because the nurses are, you know, they have a lot of land and they continue to, um, you know, grow and uh, accumulate more and more acres. Uh, they also have a lot of children and a lot of grandchildren. So there is that uh, component of jealousy there because um, Mrs. Putnam only has one child, right? She tried to have lots of babies, but only has one. So she's clearly jealous. So this is definitely out of revenge that Rebecca Nurse has been accused, okay? So Martha Corey is accused because of the pigs. Rebecca Nurse, she is accused for killing Goody Putnam's babies. All right, so nobody can really believe this. Um, and as Francis Nurse and Giles Corey are telling John Proctor and Reverend Hale and Elizabeth that their wives have been taken then Ezekiel Cheever knocks on the door, okay? So he, remember, a clerk of the court or, you know, like a police officer type of person. So he kind of knocks on the door and like, oh, excuse me, am I interrupting anything? And it's like, it's a little awkward. And, um, you know, these people obviously know Ezekiel Cheever from town and they're probably friends. So this is kind of awkward for Cheever to be knocking on the door as a police officer at this time of night. Um, and then as he comes in, let's see what he says. Oh, so uh, hold on. Aha. So he comes in now and he's chatting with everybody and he tells Proctor, I have a warrant for your wife. And Proctor, uh, you know, is super upset and he's like, what are you talking about? And he turns to Reverend Hale and he says, you said that she wasn't charged. And Hale turns back to him and says, I, I had no idea about this. Um, and Cheever, and he asks Cheever, when was she charged? 
And Cheever says that he was given 16 warrants tonight. So right now he is, you know, um, acting out these warrants. So he already picked up Martha. He already picked up Rebecca Nurse. And now he's here to pick up Elizabeth Proctor. So once again, we are seeing that people who are of really high standing in the community are being accused. Okay. So Proctor obviously asks, well, who charged her? And Cheever responds and he says, why Abigail Williams charged her. And he wants to know, you know, what proof do you have? And everybody is all up in arms about this. And Mr. Cheever says, Mr. Proctor, I have little time. The court bid me search your house, but I like not to search a house. So will you hand me any poppets that your wife may keep? And Proctor says, poppets? And Elizabeth responds with, I never kept no poppets, not since I was a girl. Okay, so think back about, you know, what um, what happened earlier in Act 2. Okay, so, you know, this is kind of like awkward and, and Cheever, you know, shyly walks over to the mantle and he's like, um, I spy a poppet, Goody Proctor. And they're all like, oh, geez, like, what, what could this possibly be about? Um, Elizabeth says that it's Mary's poppet. Um, uh, let's see what else. <laughs> Elizabeth is like, so what now? There's some sort of text about holding poppets or having poppets. You're not allowed to have those. Um, and Cheever asks, uh, as he picks up the poppet, you know, like, do you have any others in this house? And Proctor wants to know, you know, what is the importance of a poppet? Who cares? Um, and as Cheever is inspecting the poppet, you know, he finds a needle in the poppet. Okay, so this is a big deal, and, you know, he can't believe it, and he's shocked, like, he can't believe it. Well, you know, so Cheever says, the girl, the Williams girl, Abigail Williams, sir, she sat to dinner in Reverend Paris's house tonight, and without a word, nor warning, she falls to the floor, like a struck beast, he says, and screamed a scream that a bull would weep to hear, and he goes to save her, and stuck two inches in the flesh of her belly, he draw out a needle. And demanding of her how she come to be so stabbed, she testified it were your wife's familiar spirit pushed it in. Okay, so basically they're saying, or the story goes, um, that you know, Cheever is there. He's looking for poppets because the poppets they're believing are like voodoo dolls. So he finds this poppet and inside the poppet, there's a needle. <gasps> oh my gosh. Gasp. Because, you know, Elizabeth or sorry, Abigail was at dinner and falls over and she's in intense pain and they go to see what's wrong with her. And, and when they find out, they pull this big needle out of her stomach and oh my God, gosh, how did it get there? Oh, well, it was Elizabeth Proctor's spirit who stuck me with this needle. Okay, so Ezekiel Cheever is taking the needle that he finds in the poppet as proof. Okay, and he's saying, he says to everybody who's in the house, he says, tis proof, tis proof. I find here a poppet, Goody Proctor keeps. I have found it, sir. And in the belly of the poppet, a needle stuck. I tell you true, Proctor, I never warranted to see such proof of hell. And I bid you obstruct me not. Okay, so he, Cheever is taking this as hard proof. You know, Proctor's rolling his eyes um, and when this was going on, as he was examining the the poppet, um, Elizabeth had left the room to go and get Mary Warren. So now Mary Warren enters the room and John Proctor is like, Mary, you need to tell Ezekiel Cheever exactly where that poppet came from. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, Ezekiel Cheever is like, do you know this poppet? And she's like, oh, what poppet is that? Oh, um, well, I think it's mine. Okay, and and then Mary Warren tells us that she didn't mean any harm by the poppet. You know, she was 
in church for a really long time and she wanted to pass the time and not be so bored basically um and so she made the poppet so you know she she tells everybody who's there that the poppet belongs to her okay so then reverend hale chimes in and he says child you are certain this be your natural memory may it be perhaps that someone conjures you even now to say this Okay, so Reverend Hale, he's not so sure about, you know, like, what's really going on here. Are you under a spell now? And that's why you're claiming that the poppet is yours. And Mary Warren says, conjure me? Why, no, sir. I'm entirely myself, I think. Let you ask Susanna Walcott. She saw me summing it in court. Or better still, ask Abby. Abby sat beside me when I made it. So when she was in the courtroom and she was sewing the poppet, Abigail sitting right next to her. So Abigail knows about the poppet. Abigail knows that Mary Warren was making it. And if any of you have ever, <clears throat> excuse me, taken some sort of sewing class in your life, you know, sometimes when you're sewing things and you're done or you need to finish it, but you're done for the time being, you stick the needle into the garment or whatever you are making, you know, kind of as just like to hold on to the needle so you don't lose it. So do we think that Abigail probably saw that happen or do we think that Mary is trying to, you know, kind of get Elizabeth Proctor in trouble. That's something that you have to decide for yourself. But based off of what we know of Mary Warren, is she really trying to hurt the Proctors? That's something that you um, will have to think about. And Elizabeth, after hearing this, you know, she screams out and says, why, the girl is murder. She must be ripped out of the world. Oh, there it is. <laughs> And, and then Cheever goes, whoa, did you hear what she said? Ripped out of the world. That means you want her dead, okay? So th that's proof even more that you would want to, to, to stab her with the needle. And John Proctor's like, you guys all need to get out of here. My wife's not going anywhere. Get out, okay? Um, and, you know, Cheever's like, but I have this warrant. I need to, to take your wife with me. And... Um, Proctor takes the warrant and he starts to rip up the warrant. And Cheever says, you ripped the deputy gover governor's warrant, man. Like, he can't believe it. You know, this is lawlessness that's going on in the house. And, and Proctor, he's still not interested in letting Elizabeth go. And Hale's trying to, to calm uh, John Proctor down and he's saying, Proctor, if she's innocent, the court, you know, the court will set her free. And, and Proctor's like, if she is innocent. So he starts going on this rant. Like, what do you mean if she's innocent? Why do you never wonder if Paris be innocent or Abigail? Is the accuser always holy now? We or were they born this morning as clean as God's fingers? I'll tell you what's walking in Salem. Vengeance is walking Salem. We are what we always were in Salem. But now the little crazy children are jangling the keys of the kingdom and common vengeance writes the laws. This warrants vengeance. I'll not give my wife to vengeance. Okay, so he's super upset. He's saying that, you know, there's no proof to anything that any of these people are saying that he can't believe that there's warrants out for these people's arrest. The only reason that there are warrants is because people are being vengeful. They're seeking revenge on people they think that have wronged them. Everybody is exactly the same as they were before all of this started. And now it's just the wrong people have the power. Okay, so that's what John Proctor is saying. And Elizabeth is like, oh, I can't handle this anymore. You know what? I'll go, John. I'll go. And as they're walking out, Proctor says to, to Reverend Hale, will you see her taken? And Hale, you know, says, Proctor, the court is just. So he he's you know, still <laughs> siding with the court. He thinks that what the court is doing is right. And the fact that by going to trial and putting these people on the stand and letting people testify and letting people, you know, say their piece about things that like the truth will basically set them free. Okay. And then Proctor says, Pontius Pilate, God will not let you wash your hands of this. 
Um, and hopefully you see that this, this is an illusion. Do we remember what an illusion is? Oh, I hope so. Um, an illusion is when there is a reference within a text to another text or some sort of historical story. So Pontius Pilate is an illusion or a reference to the Bible. Pontius Pilate is um, a person in the Bible and he was basically a judge and he was the judge that allowed Jesus to be crucified. So um, he knew that Jesus was innocent, um, but to basically save himself so he wouldn't get in trouble, he allowed Jesus to be crucified. So John Proctor is saying basically that Reverend Hale is like Pontius Pilate. So he knows what he's doing is wrong. Um, He knows that Elizabeth is innocent and he's letting it happen anyway, kind of maybe to protect himself. Okay. Um, so then they take Elizabeth outside and they want to chain her, um, put her in handcuffs. And so, you know, Proctor freaks out and he doesn't want her to be chained. Um, and he, then he tells Elizabeth, which is really, really sweet. And he says, I will fall. Um, I will fall like an ocean on the court. Feel her, feel her nothing, Elizabeth. So we see once again, so even though there's all this turmoil in their marriage and, and tension and, and all of these problems, you know, he really does Elizabeth, does love Elizabeth. He's going to do everything in his power, um, basically to, to bring her home safely. Um, and then Giles Corey chimes in um, and and says to Reverend Hale, and yet silent minister, it is fraud. You know it is fraud. So these men, Giles Corey, Francis Nurse, uh, John Proctor, you know, very level-headed. They're not trying to seek revenge on people. They understand what's going on here and they see what's happening for what it is. And they can't believe it, you know, and, and, and their wives, unfortunately, are suffering. Okay. And then we see as we move on, um, there are other men's voices against his hail, um, in a fever of guilt and uncertainty turns from the door to avoid the sight, um, of the three women being taken away basically. Um, and then Mary Warren bursts into tears and sits up weeping. So Mary Warren can't believe that all of this is happening because when she left court, you know, like Elizabeth Proctor was safe. These people were safe. They had not yet been accused. And it wasn't until, you know, after she arrived home that the warrants were sent out um, for the um, arrests. So then Mary Warren goes to John Proctor after everybody leaves and Mary Warren says, Mr. Proctor, very likely they'll let her come home once they're given proper evidence. And John says to Mary, you're coming with me to the court or you're coming to the court with me, Mary. You will tell it in court. Um, So basically he's saying, Mary, you're coming with me tomorrow and you're going to tell the truth and you're going to tell everybody that these are lies. And then Mary says, I cannot charge murder on Abigail. And John says, you will tell the court how that poppet came here and who stuck the needle in. And then Mary Warren responds with, she'll kill me for saying that. Abby will charge lechery on you, Mr. Proctor. And he says, she's told you. Um, and then he goes on to tell Mary Warren, my ni- my wife will never die for me. I will bring your guts into your mouth, but that goodness will not die for me. So basically they're having this exchange here and John Proctor is saying, Mary Warren, you are coming to court with me tomorrow and you are going to tell everybody the truth and that there is nothing that has to do with witchcraft going on here. And Mary Warren's like, oh my gosh, like, are you kidding? You can't ask me to do that. I can't do that. And Abigail will kill me like literally kill me if you try to get me to do that not to mention you know like not only is she going to kill me but she'll tell everybody that she had an affair with you so now john proctor is like oh my gosh you know about that and he's like oh well this is crazy um you know now he's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place because you know he has to think about his credibility if he says that abigail's a liar um 
and that what's going on has nothing to do to with witchcraft and his wife is innocent, when Abigail tells everybody about the affair, it's going to seem like John Proctor is just saying these things, you know, to kind of um, cover things up or get Abigail in trouble. But then we see, you know, like John Proctor really is a good person. We see that he says, my wife will not die for me. So he's not willing to let anything bad happen to Elizabeth. And then he refers to her as that goodness. Okay. So obviously Elizabeth is a very, very good person. Um, and then lastly, we see this big internal struggle now with John and he has like a little monologue at the end and he says, now hell and heaven grapple on our backs and all our old pretense is ripped away. Make your peace, peace. It is a providence and no great change. We are only what we are, were always were, but now or but naked now. Okay, so nothing has changed. We're all still the same church going sinners that we always were. But now all of these lies and pretenses are pushed away and everybody can see everybody for who they really are. Okay, so, you know, that's a little bit of foreshadowing about what's to come, right? Think about all the lies and the things that people are hiding and now things are going to be ripped away and everybody will be exposed, okay? And there it is. I know it was long, but hopefully it was better than just having to read it on your own. <laughs>